Lisa, welcome to In Studio Now. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. I've missed you. It's been so long since we've seen each other. I know. Way too long, and it's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks. I've been looking forward to this. And Me too. It's, I guess, my only way to catch up with you is to <laughs> do an interview. I think <laughs> that's pretty that. cool. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, this will be fun. Um, gosh, I, I'm just so eager to hear the story, you know, how you started playing, performing, composing music the whole nine yards. Um, maybe just let's start uh, where you think it started and we'll and go off on our journey. <laughs> how long is this interview? We've got a couple of hours because I can <laughs> right. just go on. I know. Well, I'm eager to hear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I tell you, the first time I ever saw a piano, I know I was a year and a half old, I remember it. And we were at um, one of my parents' friends' houses they, and they had a little spinet in their dining room. And I knew there were teenagers there and stuff. I knew there were kids that were older than me. And I went over to this thing and I remember reaching up and doing that to the keys and sound came out. And I was like, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm just kind of pre-verbal, but that feeling of, oh my gosh, what is this thing? There are people that live here that know how to do this. And my parents were in another room with their friends and I'm still doing the thing going, I need to know how to do this. And finally my dad came in, picked me up, turned off the light, and I'm like, there's a magic thing in there. Why isn't everyone in the other room? But <laughs> So that was my first experience with a piano and I've been in love with it ever since. You took right to it. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah it yeah. stuck, obviously. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and so every place we went that there was even something that looked remotely like a piano, you know, I was right there. My dad um, rented us a Lowry organ, yeah. not knowing that organs and pianos are very different instruments. Right. But I still, we you know, we did the lessons and I did the little books and I did all the, the Lowry stuff. But when I was 10 years old, he finally got us a piano, mm. a little spinet, that I still have that lives in my son's house now. Mm. And, um, you know, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because before that, a friend of mine, I never forget her, her name, Darla Wickers, and she had this horrible, awful, upright piano in a basement without windows with a bare light bulb hanging over it, not in tune, some of the keys didn't work, but I was always in that basement trying to play this piano. And I remember one day she said to me, she goes, you know, she goes, I think the only reason you ever come over here is to play this piano. And it's like, um, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> Lovely. So. Yeah. Well, and when did the uh, writing, composing come along? Did you just start creating on the piano? Yeah, when I started, because I, I, I played by ear and I had decided in my 10-year-old brain that that was the best way to learn, that nobody else knew more than I did about <laughs> how I wanted to play the piano. And so I, I, my parents got me a Hannon exercise book, if you know what that is. I remember those days, is. yes. <laughs> and it just has a lot of notes on the page. It's like kind of scary looking when you're 10. But I used to just make up songs and I'd have the book open and I'd have my little brother come in and I'm going, listen to this song that I'm playing. And I'd pretend that I was reading the music and I was really making up stuff. And he goes, that's not real music. You're just making that up. <laughs> he busted you. He busted me. <laughs> but, but you he was kept right, at it. And I kept at it. Yeah. And now that's what I do. I make up right. songs. Right. <laughs> And that begets a great question. At some point in time, an artist has to decide on, this is my profession. Mm -hmm. That's a big jump, a big leap of faith. Yeah. When did you take that? It was never a question. I, it right. was just never, ever a question. I always wanted to do you this. You just knew this. Yep. Yeah. I wanted to be Rick Wakeman at one point, <laughs> right. which is hard when you're a woman of color. I, you, the blonde hair just wasn't happening for me and stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted all those, because all those key, because back then, keyboards were not polyphonic, right? They were right. monophonic. So yes. you ha he had to have all those keyboards Stacks around them, him right. so he could play more than one note at a time. But mm -hmm. I just thought that was the best thing on earth, and that's all yeah. I wanted. 
Was so you good. emulated Rick Wakeman and yes and <laughs> yes <laughs> anything you get your hands on indeed I, imagine. Uh -huh. I when I was younger than that I tried to make a piano out of cardboard mm. which was less than satisfying <laughs> I tried wrapping um, rubber bands around a cigar box again less than satisfying my parents finally got me a silver tone guitar from Sears mm. which was more satisfying and so I, I learned how to play the guitar, and um, but yeah, piano was piano was always it for me, always. So when did you start to compose pieces, uh, put names to them, and try to show them to the world, let them listen? Well, that's a good question because I I do remember the very first song I ever wrote. Um, but it wasn't, I mean, I was a little kid, so I wasn't thinking that I was going to play it for an audience or something. Right. Probably the very, very first piece I ever wrote that was um, like concert worthy, that I still play in concert today, is a song that I call Twins. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that happened um, right after I had a miscarriage. Oh, my goodness. Two twin boys, Jason and Jacob, and and just all the emotion around that poured out into this song. Mm. And but that that was probably the very first professional song that I wrote. Yeah. And you recorded it later on. I did. That's the beautiful thing about it's it. It's on my very first album. Wow. Yeah. Think on these things. Yes. And do you like to take real life experiences? to generate the energy to compose with? And what, what's your process? Or is that one of many you know, It's routes one you of take? many. It's one of many. And I get asked that question an awful lot. And, and you know, it's, it's everything from how the keys feel under my fingers. Right. Which is why I love Yamaha piano so much. Mm. You know, that action, there's just nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. No other piano anywhere. And so a lot of that inspiration comes from just the kinetic feeling mm. of playing. Um, sometimes I've I created a piece called Universe Maker with something that I've come to call dark playing, which is yeah. just lights out and I'm just emoting at the piano. It doesn't even have to make musical sense, just emoting. And I was doing that one night and and I suddenly heard something that I liked and turned the light on and then I could follow it and go, oh, look at that. Now it's a piece. There's a, a really cool way um, that happens rarely but occasionally that a song will just appear in my head, just start to finish like I was listening to it on the radio. And the gift is one of those pieces. And that happened right after my son, Andrew, was born. And I was depressed, freaked out, overwhelmed. And I drove up to the mountains. I did get a babysitter. I didn't leave him alone. <laughs> okay. Good but, to but clarify. <laughs> yeah, you got to say that. And, um, you know, I'm just feeling really depressed. And interestingly enough, here's this song, and it's really upbeat really energetic, really happy. And I thought, okay, that's weird. And I got back in the car, went home, tried to get it out on the I mean, I could hear all the or orchestration, everything. But in, especially my first album, but really all of them, sometimes I think, you know, it's almost disingenuous to say that Lisa Downing is the composer because it's like, it's just there. I hear it, I don't know where it comes from. Right, right. You know? Well, two things that, it, it sounds like you're able to transform your emotion if you were sad into this beautiful, happy place. And isn't that the beauty of music for a composer? They can go somewhere other than emotionally right. they're at at the time. Yeah. And I know you have a special affinity for the universe, this universality of a thing we tap into musically that I, I believe you feel we're all, I, I guess, we have the ability to tap in and then if you pay attention enough to those emotions or find that place 
It's a conduit through yourself into the composition. Right. Can you explain that a little bit? I, I probably hacked it up no, quite, it, quite a bit. <laughs> no, it was pretty close. It was pretty close. I, I feel like there's this universal source and it's just going on infinitely, infinitely on. And that you can get quiet enough inside yourself to where you can hook into it. And maybe that's why it's called a piece of music, because it's just a piece right. of this infinite source yeah. of music. And for me, I grab this piece and then whatever or limited skills I have on the piano, because it's not exactly what I hear in my head. What I hear in my head is much bigger and broader and, like I said, full orchestration and everything. And I have to sort of score reduce to get it just on the piano. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's as good as that's going to get. <laughs> Fascinating. Wow. <laughs> Well, you talked about a couple of pieces off of your first recording. Um, I came to know you more when A Delicate Balance came out. Would you like to talk about a piece or two off of that? Oh. Beautiful, beautiful recording. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, that piece took a long time. That was a long time coming because my first um, CD, I think, on these things, was in the very early 90s. My son was very young. And then there was nothing but, and I was a single mom for many years, and so that took a lot, up a lot of time. But once he moved out of the house, then that was my opportunity to be able to compose and compose songs all about that experience of bringing up Andy. <laughs> wow. So yeah. pretty much every song on that album is something about Andrew. How about that? The Gift, yeah. which is the song I was just mm -hmm. talking about. Make Believe, you know, he would sit at the, uh, on the floor at the piano when I was practicing and be making up all kinds <laughs> of stuff and flying teddy bears and everything. It's and a very childlike state in that piece, but it's so enamoring because it gets to the heart of something we all remember. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that piece is universally loved because of that that connection. Yeah. Bedtime song, another one yes. where I was telling, I would, every night I would, it was really hard and if you're a parent, you, you sort of know this, you know, that it's really hard to get your kid to tell you what happened at school. You know, you <laughs> right. say, how is school fine? What did you do? Nothing. And you're like, okay, how many, and maybe I've heard something from another mom or a teacher or something. So I know something's going on. And one of the ways that I drew that out of him was I told him these bedtime stories with a, a dragon named Jasper. And it would okay. always start out with, you know, wise Prince Andy who lived in a big castle with his beautiful mother. And then we would go on with the dragon story and mm. maybe Jasper got in a fight with his friend, mom. Me and Mike, we got in a fight just like that. It's like, really? You know, so it was a real yeah. way to draw stuff out right. of him. And then in my most recent album, I wrote a piece about Jasper the Dragon, which I discovered was really a dragon that lived inside of me, that energy, that power. Mm. But the bedtime song started out Beautiful. with Jasper. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk uh, about the, the latest CD you have, which I feel is a huge departure for you. It touches emotions deeper in the music than I felt in a long time. It's an incredible recording. Wow. <laughs> that means yeah. a lot coming from you. Piece Bob. after piece. Well, it, it, genres are a bad term, I think, because we hate to label things, especially for artists. But you touch so many different uh, elements. There's some jazz, as you reference your father in, in Harlem Nocturne. Right. Um, th there's childlike, but most importantly, I wanted to get to this point, that you seem to be exploring the innermost regions of yourself, your heart, your life. It's very deep in that fashion. And the music is so ex expressive but impressionistic at the same time. All these words come to mind because it's so colorful. <laughs> I'll shut up and let you talk because what a recording. <laughs> well, you know, as the, the title suggests, the wisdom of my shadow, I, I was exploring um, my inner life and realizing that, 
you know, a lot of the stuff, even in a delicate balance, you know, sort of happy and how new age kind of is, you know, that beautiful sunlight, all that, you know, and, and all of that is great, but there is this place inside of all of us that is that shadow place that that if you don't explore it and acknowledge it, it comes out in really un inappropriate hmm. ways. And so, um, and not that that was my motive, it just came out that way. And I started writing like Black Wedding, Forbidden Dance, and I thought, okay, I gotta try to make this music happier because this is weird. <laughs> and it just wouldn't stop. So every song was kind of in that same vein. And so I wasn't sure exactly where the muse was sort of taking me, but I decided to submit to that, you know, and yeah. just kind of go with it and see what happened. I found, I was looking online for the cover picture um, and just Googled the wisdom of my shadow just to see what would come up, you know, images right. on Google. And this beautiful picture by Susan Seden Boulay, she's passed now in 95, yeah. but she is sort of the quintessential goddess um, artist, painter. And she, and, and this picture came up, I'm like, that's it. I mean, it kind of looks like me even, you mm -hmm. know? And so I just, I, I loved that portrait. And it took a year to, first of all, figure out how to get a hold of who was holding her estate and who was, you know, and her son um, was gracious enough to give me permission to use it. And, right. and so it just all sort of fell together. And, and I was able to collaborate on some things yeah. with some other artists that I, I had never had the opportunity to do before. Right, right. There are some people, well, well worth the wait to have the cover that depicts your expression to the fullest. It really yeah. was. It really was. I was so thrilled to be able to get permission to use that, that painting. Um, so anyway, yeah, it, it, to explore the, sh the darker regions of myself, the shadow part of me, there is wisdom there. Sure. And you don't want to leave that on the table. You know, you, it's, it's uncomfortable sometimes. Right. But it's important. Well, it seems as though there are dark places on there, but there's a lot of hope amongst that. So I think you were able to gravitate toward the light somehow on all of these pieces. And that's what an artist's task in life is, I believe. And yeah. And you were able to accomplish that. Oh, thank you. So you're well, not left feeling, you know, this <laughs> overwhelming sense of dreariness. It's, it's a beautiful recording with, laced with hope throughout. I really think so. It was the, the hope was that I was able to express, to really emote in these recordings. That was my goal, was to just be as vulnerable as I possibly could be. It really comes out in the music, and I have to say it again. It's you reach a place, and as an artist, when you can convey that to your listener, it's a job well done. So, congrats on that. Thank you. <laughs> well deserved. Well, you've been a touring monster for the last number of years. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I turn around, you're going to Spain, Argentina, yeah. all, all places all over the globe to play your music for different cultures with different artists. Yeah. Talk a bit about that experience, and my goodness. <laughs> Boy, you know, it's funny, you know, I think of what I thought it was going to be like as I dreamed of doing it, because really, and, and we were going to talk about Vision Quest Entertainment, the talent agency that I own and right. have for the last 36 years. But that started because I was recording the, the first album. And I sent a cassette to Will Ackerman at Wyndham Hill and didn't hear anything from him. So I decided to start my own company, Vision Quest Music, because I was on a quest for my vision to become a concert pianist. Oh. And so for all those years that I was playing piano in restaurants and hotels and all of that kind of stuff, raising my son, mm -hmm. you know, it was all focused on someday this is you know, it's going to be my time. I'm going to be able to do this. Wow. 
And so once he left home, mm -hmm. which I never had the empty nest syndrome. No. <laughs> that, that, you filled that, it quite never, nicely, it yeah, sounds like. that never happened. <laughs> and so anyway, you know, the time that I had to be able to spend composing a delicate balance and also Christmas for two. Yes. And um, my very first experience um, doing a professional concert happened because my son introduced me to MySpace. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> and MySpace to me was sort of like opening this window and poking my head through and you could talk to anybody, anybody. Right. And so I thought, if I could talk to anybody, who would I talk to? Well, my idol, Liz Story. Wow. <laughs> and so I typed a little note to her, left her my number. Nothing, nothing, I thought. Well, one day I was in Sears um, at Southwest Plaza doing some shopping, and my cell phone rang. And I looked at it. It said, Story, Liz. I'm like, <laughs> What? Well, that's the real. <laughs> so I'm like in the women's clothing department talking to Liz Story for the first time. And, and she was so sweet. She's like, she went, I think I've heard of you, which I don't think she has. But she felt, you know, some familiarity there. And, and I said, I, I was just wondering if you would ever consider doing a, a concert with me. She goes, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Matter of what? factly, <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, that'll be good. Well, let me um, let me see what I can put together, and you know, and I was all calm and everything. And I'm like, what am I gonna do now? I've got, I've never done. I did a concert once, right out of college. <laughs> okay. And everything else was hotels and restaurants and weddings and birthday parties and whatever concert. Right. So this was a whole new thing. And so I created a little tour with her and Joseph Akins, and, mm -hmm. and that's what started that. But I had to create these albums, because I'd had nothing to sell but the first album. So right. I recorded both of those albums at once, which, let me tell you, is not a good idea. <laughs> if you ever think you want to record two albums at once, let me tell you, please don't. Why not? <laughs> I want to know directly, why not? <laughs> it is so much work. It yeah. is so much work. And especially when you're doing two different, you know, like your original pieces and Christmas and trying to balance all of that and right. the emotions around all of that. And yeah, just not a good idea. But I did it. Mm -hmm. I did it. You know, I was happy with it. I had product to sell. Yeah. And then we distributed it to ZMR, its own music reporter, formerly New Age reporter. Right. And my promoter sent it to all over the world. Hmm. Well, and then I got a call from Spain from a gentleman named Alejandro, and he asked me if I would come to Spain and do a concert. But of course. I know. <laughs> Let me just say um, yes, <laughs> and then hang up and scream, and oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. I don't know what I just said yes to. And um, see who else was with David, David Lawn, Suzanne Ciani, oh yeah. um, Rebecca Oswald, Julio Mazziotti, who, who I've toured with mm. a lot, and just wonderful people. And, but it was it felt like an accident, kinda. But I, th I think because you put so much effort into this vision you had, yeah, isn't it funny? You have the thought, and then it becomes reality. I think yeah. that's the difference with artists. They somehow, you're able to make these thoughts into reality. And there you are touring with the very people you listen to and perhaps idolized. Indeed. Incredible. Indeed. Well, and I got to tell you, right before, right before the Liz Story thing happened, um, Pete, my husband, and I were at a Chamber of Commerce meeting for Vision Quest, you know. And so, and there's hundreds of people there. Everybody's drinking, free food. It's always fun. And I told Pete, I said, you know, I'm going to change this up. I'm just going to start telling people I'm an international concert pianist, and let's just see what happens. Right. And really, that's when the manifestation really happened. When I started saying it and telling it to people, it became real. It yeah. it seemed like magic. Right. It seemed right. like magic. There's yeah. something to that. If you verbalize something, especially outside of your own realm to yeah. other people, yeah. somehow that 
that universality starts to happen. I, it does it's interesting. seem to work that way. Absolutely. And it, but it works the opposite way, too. It can work with ne negative stuff if you start thinking negatively. That's right. That's right. You I strike me as a very positive person <laughs> since I've known you. And listen, life is full of lots of ups and downs. In fact, I'd like to talk about a, a down point in your life. You recently had a car accident. I did. And I'd like to know a little bit about the experience because once you gain all this, suddenly it can be taken away right before your eyes. It absolutely could. And it happened almost exactly a year ago. It was on January 2nd. What a way to start the year, no right? No kidding. And I had this beautiful little car. You know the car. Yes. My little Tiburon, my little black Tiburon. We right otherwise known as the Batmobile. <laughs> I loved that car. And I was just doing mm. daily errands. I was on my way to teach piano lessons and um, I was going south and two cars were ahead of me. They went through the green light. Another car was coming north. She was turning, she didn't see me and pulled right in front of me, I T-boned her. Oh. Car destroyed. I mean, I. I, the car started smoking, I got out, and I thought, how did I live through this? And I thought, maybe I'm not alive. Maybe it's like those movies, you know, where you you're like, out of your body. yeah. <sighs> but I looked in there and I wasn't in there, so I thought, okay, I'm not dead. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, everything was messed up. I had tingling and numbness in both hands for months. Mm. So I couldn't really play. It, it took me off, I, it took me off the road took me out of everything. Um, I tried not to let anybody know that mm -hmm. because my fear was that people would understand that I was, you know, had some physical um, difficulties because of the accident and would stop hiring me. You did want to give them an excuse to Right. Stop you from playing. Well, right. At the expense of your own health. Right. Most likely, right? Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, that was a difficult time, but I, I, and I didn't share a lot. I mean, I, I, I did share this, the accident on Facebook. I, I posted the pictures and all that kind of stuff and said, well, this happened. What a drag. Everybody's like, oh, that's so sad. I'm so sorry. And, your poor car, but yeah. more importantly, your physical well being and, the long journey back. And Talk I a didn't little bit really about realize this. how hurt I was, you know, because after the numbness and tingling subsided in my hands and I could play, then suddenly the whole pelvic sacrum thing mm. became really acute in September. And then I couldn't walk. Oh, oh my gosh. I was in pain 24 7, just excruciating pain. And, um, and it's been a difficult, it's been a difficult year. I can well imagine. It seems though the type of personality you are, you kept that burning desire to get back to the stage, composing and recording, all of those things. Is that what got you through, aside from your family? What's the secret to something like that? I mean, it's hard to manage that type of things, the unknown. Valium. Lots <laughs> right. of Valium. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Calms you down enough yeah. <laughs> day by day, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, really, though, my family has been so supportive. Pete, yeah. my husband, I mean, he's just been there. Okay, see, so stop. Yeah. Because um, mascara, right? We can't have that. Well, not waterproof. But Pete, I'll tell you, he's been by your side for a good part of this journey is one of the most yep. loyal, lovely people anyone could meet. Absolutely, and I mean, he's been my tour manager, my yeah. marketing director, he's just there. Right, You know, every step of the way. Absolutely, and this has been no different. Mm. I mean, I'm sure it's different for him because it's way more difficult um, because I haven't been able to, to carry my weight, right. you know? And every day is another therapy appointment, mm. but the good news is today is day eight of being pain-free Wow! after six months. That's great news. Yes. Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But it's been, it, mm. you know, it's kept me away from, the, from practicing because right. I can't sit that long right. at, the, at the bench. But what it did provide me 
was um, a year to do all the sheet music. Ah. And I don't do this myself, let me tell you. Rebecca Oswald has made a deal mm -hmm. with the devil because she is an amazing transcriptionist. Mm -hmm. And so she's done all the first passes on all 48 of my compositions. Wow. And then she hands them back to me, then I go through and I do all the hand switches, all the fingerings, all the chord symbols, which let me tell you, I thought it was gonna take me six months and now it's been two years. Wow, <laughs> it's quite an endeavor, isn't but, it? I, but what got me started doing this, and it was before the accident that I started this, my son said, Mom, he goes, this is legacy stuff. He goes, if That's you right. don't do this, he goes, then I'm going to have to do it. And I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, we can't let that happen. Uh, I need to get busy. <laughs> Well, that's a good push. Yeah. And you said you're able to document this for future generations, and it is very well your legacy. And it's so important to do that. And it's been so wonderful because I've been I've had the opportunity to do master classes yeah. with students that have performed my pieces. Wow. And so before and so these pieces I, I do all the graphic design, I put the story of the piece in it now. Mm -hmm. But before that it was just the piece. And so the students got the piece. And without any, you know, hint of what the story of, of the piece was, and came to the master class and played it for me and for the audience. How gratifying to hear your own work. Very. <laughs> but the interesting part is, then I told them what the story was. Ah. To see how it would change their playing. And it did. Absolutely. Dramatically. And then that was so interesting. Well, and how many people get the insight of a composer that you usually only have what's down on a page or from a recording, but right. to have that insight, yeah. that's doubly valuable. Yeah. So how great to share. And that, that begets another point, you as a teacher, during all of this, you've taught so many students over the years, <laughs> my goodness, yeah. all these balls afloat at once. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about teaching. Teaching, I'm telling you what, I learn as much from my students or more then they learn from me. And teaching, people have, an, um, I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding about teaching. It's like as if I have this thing that I give you. But really what it is, is that I'm assessing where you are and helping you to express what's already in you. It's right. not me doing it. It's, it's the student doing it. And I'm just like, you know, well, have you thought about this? I wonder how this is. This is how it is for me. You know, and that's my method anyway. Helping them overcome the obstacles that prevent yeah. you from realization, right? And being honest about that's it. That's right. A lot of people in my life, a lot of teachers in my life, a lot of musicians in my life haven't been honest with me about what this is you know, this performance thing. Right. You know, everybody wants you to think that it is how it is on stage, and it's just not. No. no. <laughs> At all. Yeah. My students think that, I, that I'm not nervous when I get up on stage, and I'm terrified. Every single time out, right? Every single time Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Every single time out. That's a good sign. According terror? to most terror, <laughs> it, it means something still to you. I think oh, the day yeah. that you're not nervous, they say it's probably the day to hang it up yeah. because you lose that importance, that value, that communication between you and the audience and it, that right. fear of the unknown. And do you, once you get up there on stage and you start playing, it dissipates and you fall into the music? Or what happens for you? What's your experience? Um... Uh, are we allowed to use expletives on this? Or Absolutely. <laughs> Damn it, <most> yes. <laughs> most of the time, I'm thinking, don't fuck up, don't fuck up, don't fuck up, don't fuck up. That's what I'm thinking. Right. Um, occasionally, I think, you know, I'm playing and it's happening and I hear somebody, you know, maybe whispering in the front row. Somebody says, gosh, she's really good. And I think, God, they think I'm really good. Oh, no, where am I? Oh, my God. You know, and so, I mean, it's, it's such a fragile sort of um, 
behavior. It is being isn't a musician. It? It's I liken it to a dream state when you're up playing on stage, and the moment you become self-aware, it all crumbles. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's exactly it. it it's, yeah. It's all there. It's and beautiful, isn't it? It really the highs, is. lows, laughter, and the insanity of it. <laughs> and the insanity of it. But the key thing that keeps getting brought up over and over again is that it's not about me. It's not even about the audience. It's about the music. It's right. about the music. It's always about the music. Yeah. That's and I'm the bottom just, line. Just starting to grasp this, you know, in this stage of my career, leaving the oh my God, I can barely play, I hope this sounds okay, to the, this has to be absolutely perfect, flawless, to the, I really want this to express my emotions, and then and going deeper into that arena. Right, right. That's very well said. It, that self-awareness dissipates, but it's that conveyance of emotion, because you want to describe what's in your soul. You don't get the chance or... Who knows how many more times we'll get to play in front of someone right. and express that piece. Right. So it's, it becomes a very valuable commodity. Yeah. The I guess the uh, the beauty of performance, and we can't take it for granted. You know. Well, you and just that. like you said, just like the car accident could have been over just like that. That's right. Boy. You know, and and it wasn't. Right. Thank goodness and so for I all get, of us. Uh, I get to do this some more. Absolutely. Let's go into a piece of yours. Um, and you tell me, um, <laughs> there's so many great pieces, but I'd love for you to play something for us today. Okay. And um, you pick and let's talk a little bit about it and then have you perform it. Well, how about if we do this? How about if I perform it? And if it's good, then we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. The, com the, the confidence is just oozing out, Lisa. Beautiful. I know. Thanks. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Okay. Let's do it.
That's one. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Lisa, beautiful piece. Uh, one of my personal favorites from way back when. Thank you. Yeah, that was from my very first album, Think on These Things. Wow. Yeah. And called Personal Freedom. Well, and that brings the point over time as an artist, we have different currents of emotion that come through our lives. Um, tell me how you approach a piece like this as we grow older and become more sophisticated you must bring that into these, these tunes. It may mean something different to you at this point in time than it did. It does. And as I was saying, you know, I'm speaking about my father and, and his, his grandfather. Um, it has sort of taken on that meaning for me in terms of personal freedom, what that meant to, to not be a slave anymore in Mississippi. Um, in other pieces, um, the song, The Dragon Within. Um, and, and I was talking a little bit before about the bedtime song and how that sort of all came about. But this, The Dragon Within was about Jasper, the dragon. But as I was writing it about Jasper, I realized that that power and energy of that dragon was the power and energy that lived inside of me that lived inside and does live inside of all women. Right. You know, and, um, and it's not just a feminine energy, although it feels to me, of course, that it is, but I think, you know, even men can have that, that powerful feminine energy. Right. And it's interesting how we tend to fear that power, that feminine energy means something. But, but so, so that song evolved from trying to tell the story of the dragon to then it told the story of myself. A sense of empowerment is what I took from that. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're feeling when you play that now? I mean, there's Absolutely. indecision, but in the end, I feel it's a very positive message that comes through. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it is the, the energy that I use to get through the day and, you know, t getting through being a single mom getting through owning a business in a man's world, you know? Absolutely. Getting through being a concert pianist in a man's world. And, and it's, it's just something that, that through, I guess, the school of hard knocks, you just kind of develop within you. Right. And interestingly enough, that particular piece was used in the Dana Crawford story. <sighs> Right, the, the builder architect downtown Larimer Square, right. right? She developed that, yes. Right, and it was a Rocky Mountain PBS program, and it was called Great Colorado Women, and this was one of the episodes. And back in the day, Dana Crawford was known as the Dragon Lady. Huh. Because she was the one that was going to collect all the rents and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Well, they used this piece as they were describing that. So I just thought that was like completely perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the undertones, which no one but you knew about. Right. It's right. ironic, really, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Or serendipitous, at least. Right, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, and it fit what they were talking about. The music actually fit, so. No question. So y'all have to be watching that. <laughs> Dana Crawford. We've followed you on a long journey throughout your life. What's next for you? What does the future hold for Lisa Downing? You know, I love that question, actually. And there's, there's so much. First of all, I, um, professionally, I need to absolutely finish the transcriptions, which are almost done, you know, and get all the graphic design and all of that sort of thing finished. Um, I need to finish healing. From the car accident right so i can sit right. at the piano and and practice and compose and get back on the road um but really what's next for me is paying more attention to myself because i tend to power through all kinds of stuff and intolerable situations and and put myself in positions of being required to do things that are just outside of my reach. And not that that's a bad thing, but when you do it 24-7, it takes a toll on your body. And you can't do that 
right. and not hurt yourself. It takes a toll on your psyche as well. It does. And unbeknownst to you at the time, it, it catches up. It catches up and it has caught up with me. And so yeah. I need to learn how to relax and say no. Right. Once in a while. Cause, cause I understand that. All these things that I want to do sound so wonderful to be able to, you know, that I'm asked to do, to tour or to compose or to collaborate. And all these things I want to say yes to. And in the past, I always have said yes. And now is a time for me to start saying no to some of the stuff, to be able to focus on what's important to me. But primarily, I need to learn how to relax. Right. Somebody told me I just need to take a nap once in a while. <laughs> well, there's a lesson in there for all of us, and I think. So we wish nothing but the biggest cornucopia of patience and relaxation for, for you, Lisa. Uh, well, thanks. I sure look forward to hearing the next great thing from you and the next recording. You keep playing, and good things will come your way. Not only for you, but for us. We look forward to the future, Lisa. And thanks again for joining us on our beautiful show here, the first, first one, inaugural show. So thank hey. you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been a blast. I love catching up with you. And it's been great. It's too bad it can't be three hours long. We'll just continue right. the interview. Like, well, you know, this. saying that, what we should do is have you back, and we do a, a session actually in the control room of the studio where we'll break down one of your pieces literally in the studio playback and you can comment and tell us what you were thinking at different points of the piece i'd love to do that with you i would dig inside love of it. <laughs> that i would love that that would be wonderful cool well i look forward to that day and again please rest relax <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you soon lisa thank Thanks, you Vaughn. thank you so much <laughs>